2 in Philosophy Historically by Robert Piercy. This chapter explains what it means to do philosophy historically. It gives an account of this enterprise's goal and methods, one that distinguishes it both from the practice of philosophy more narrowly construed and from the study of the history of philosophy. It also investigates the value of this activity. It explains what kind of illumination it offers and why this illumination is worth seeking, why this illumination is worth seeking. To this end, I first examine a number of current views about what is involved in doing philosophy historically and explain why I find them inadequate. Next, I raise the question of what kind of understanding is gained through the study of history, any kind of history. I do so by drawing on John Herman Randall's discussion of the genetic method. I then extend Randall's discussion of the genetic method to the case of philosophy and explain how a study of past philosophy might teach philosophical lessons. Finally, since my discussion relies heavily on the notion of philosophical picture, I end the chapter by clarifying this notion's meaning and defending its use. Current views. It is difficult to describe the enterprise of doing philosophy historically in very general terms. Imagine two ideal types, the pure philosopher and the pure historian of philosophy. The pure philosopher is interested solely in doing philosophy, that is, in discovering the answers to contem contemporary philosophical questions. That is, in discovering the answers to contemporary, sorry, <laughs> repeating, in, to contemporary philosophical questions. She may want to know whether on cost of free action is possible or moral values objective, for example. She may not be particularly interested in the history of earlier attempts to answer these questions. She simply wants to know the answers, and she may not think that a familiar familiarity with the history of her questions will help her find them. Indeed, the pure philosopher may suspect that paying too much attention to this history will lead her away from the answers she seeks. After all, if earlier philosophers had succeeded in answering the questions that vex her, and surely these questions will no longer be asked. The work of earlier philosophers may be interested in its own right, and studying it may be a good exercise for students, but according to the pure philosopher, there is no reason to think that it will help us solve philosophical problems. To fail to see this is to lapse into antiquarianism. The pure historian of philosophy, on the other hand, is interested solely in understanding the work of philosophers from the past. He wants to know what their views were, and to understand these views on their own terms. To determine whether Spinoza was a pantheist, what Plato thought about mathematical entities, and so on. Understanding, understanding what these philosophers really thought, he claims, is quite different from using their work to advance contemporary philosophical agendas. No doubt a clever reader can make Spinoza, Spinoza say interesting things about our contemporary ecological crisis, or make Plato say interesting things about the state of literary theory, but the pure historian of philosophy is concerned with what Spinoza and Plato really thought, and he doubts whether such appropriations help us to discover this. Whereas the pure philosopher fears antiquarianism, the pure historian of philosophy fears anachronism. To understand the great figures from the history of philosophy, he insists, is to understand them as they understood themselves. Not to translate their work into contemporary idioms they would not recognize. We might provisionally say that those who do philosophy historically take neither the pure philosopher nor the pure historian of philosophy as their ideal. They reject the division between doing philosophy and studying its history, between solving contemporary problems and trying to understand philosophers from the past. They maintain, as Peter Hare puts it, that a philosopher can at once make a contribution to the solution of current philosophical problems and a contribution to the history of thought. They claim that one can do philosophy by studying its history and engagement, and an engagement with history of philosophy can contribute to the solution of contemporary philosophical problems. In the most general terms, then, we might say that to do philosophy historically is to reject the assumptions of the pure philosopher and the pure historian of philosophy and to pursue both of their agendas at once. This characterization is useful for fixing ideas, but it faces two problems. First, it is purely negative. It tells us what doing philosophy historically is not, but not what it is. It has nothing positive to say about the enterprise's goals, methods, or value. 
Second and more importantly, the pure philosopher, pure philosopher and pure historian of philosophy are impossibly ideal types, and it is difficult to imagine a living person actually engaged in either enterprise. The problem is not just that most philosophers do this. Um, the problem is not that most philosophers do both systematic and historical work. At least some of the time, though, this is no doubt true. Rather, the problem is that this is not that it is not clear that either enterprise is coherent even as an ideal. The pure philosopher, has, as I have described her, is interested solely in the answers to philosophical questions, not in their history. But it's obviously impossible to try to answer philosophical questions until one has learned what questions are genuinely philosophical ones. And this, surely, is something one learns largely through an uh, acquaintance with history. By seeing which questions philosophers have traditionally posed, how these questions differ from those traditionally posed by other enterprises, and so on. Likewise, the pure historian of philosophy, as I have described them, wants to understand past philosophers in their own terms, rather than filtering their work anachronistically through contemporary concerns. But does this goal even make sense? What would it mean to avoid anachronism altogether, and to understand a text purely on its own term? As Richard Rorty and others have pointed out, quote, if to be anachronistic is to link a past X to a present Y rather than studying it in, its, in isolation, then every historian is always anachronistic. With awesome selecting, the historian is reduced to duplicating the text which constitute the relevant past. But why do that? We turn to the historian because we do not understand the copy of the text we already have. Giving us a second copy will not help. To understand the text just is to relate it helpfully to something else. The only question is what that something else will be. End quote. In practice, the, to accuse someone of anachronism is not to accuse her of relating a past X to a present Y, but to accuse her of relating a past X to the wrong present Y, rather than some other more fruitful one. It seems then that the pure philosopher and the pure historian of philosophy are both impossible ideals. But that is the case, then it is obviously unsatisfactory to say that doing philosophy historically means rejecting these ideals. Everyone rejects these ideals, and must, because they are incoherent. As a result, a number of philosophers have tried to give more precise characterization of what it means to do philosophy historically. One such account is offered by Peter Hare. As noted above, Hare thinks that to do philosophy historically is to try to contribute to two enterprises at once. The solution of contemporary philosophical problems on the one hand, an accurate understanding of history of thoughts on the other. We all engage in both enterprises to some degree and must, but those who do philosophy historically, Hare maintains, have distinctive understanding of the kinds of values these activities possess. According to Hare, most, most of us think these enterprises possess intrinsic value alone. It is good to contribute to the solutions of philosophical problems. It's also good to understand past philosoph philosophers accurately. But on this view, they, the search for philosophical illumination has negative or at least negligible instrumental value as a means to the intrinsic value of histor ac historical accuracy. Those who do philosophy historically, by contrast, maintain that each enterprise possesses instrumental value as well as intrinsic, intrinsic value because of the way which it can assist the other enterprise. Doing philosophy is valuable both for its own sake and because it helps us understand the work of historical figures better. Learning about figures in the history of philosophy is valuable both for its own sake and because it helps us do, to do philosophy better. Furthermore, Hare claims that we can use the notion of instrumental value to distinguish three different ways of doing philosophy historically. It appears, quote, it appears that among those doing philosophy historically, one, some consider philosoph philosophical illumination valuable primarily as a means to historical accuracy. Two, others consider, it his other, others consider historical accuracy valuable primarily as a means to philosophical illumination. And three, so others continue, consider both historical accuracy and philosophical illumination to have much of both intrinsic and instrumental value, end quote. What these approaches share is the conviction that both philosophy and the history of philosophy may be instruments of understanding. 
the accurate understanding of past thoughts is not just desirable in itself. It also means to fill. It also mean. It is also a means to philosophical illumination. The difficulty with Hare's account is that it does not explain what this philosophical illumination illumination is. Hare's suggestion that the practice of philosophy and the study of, of its history possess instrumental value as well as intrins intrinsic value, and that doing one can help us do the other, are promising starting points. But Hare does not explain how they help us do so, or why. Why exactly does an accurate understanding of past philosophical thought make us better philosophers? Why does it leave us better able to contribute to solutions of contemporary philosophical problems? Similarly, why does a facility in solving contemporary philosophical problems make us better historians of philosophy? Hare accounts does not say. It simply asserts that when we do philosophy historically, the practice of philosophy and the study of its history assist one another. It does not tell us in what this assistance consists. So while Hare's account is a step in the right direction, it is also incomplete. We must look for a different account of what it means to do philosophy historically. Another such account is offered by Richard Campbell. Campbell claims that there are three major differences between simply studying the history of philosophy and doing philosophy historically. First, doing philosophy historically involves a different telos than the study of the history of philosophy. Quote, whereas historians of philosophy seek as far as possible a correct account of past thinkers and often bracket their own belief and values so that they are not on the line as they engage in their scholarly work, those who philosophize historically undertake a historically oriented task whose point is precisely to enrich the self-understanding of their own historical situation, end quote. Historians of philosophy seek accuracy, faithful representation of what earlier philosophers believe. Those who do philosophy historically are more interested in identifying and, and clarifying the quite particular set of problems that the past has handed down to them in the hope of understanding how and why these problems have become important. Second, historians of philosophy and those who do philosophy historically operate with different conceptions of truth. For the former, truth is correctness. A true history of philosophy is one that accurately represents what Aquinas and Aristotle really thought. For the latter, a piece of work that does, that does philosophy historically is true to the extent that it furthers our own self-understanding and illuminates our present condition. Such a philosopher is therefore operating perhaps unconsciously with the conception of truth as a revelatory and transforming event. Finally, Campbell claims that doing philosophy historically involves a different consciousness than studying the history of philosophy. The historian of philosophy remains focused upon the thinking of the past. Their thoughts are what the inquiry is about. But whoever philosophizes historically is engaged essentially in a complex act of self-consciousness. One enters into the past only to return to oneself. In other words, studying the history of philosophy involves a different type of understanding than doing philosophy historically. Whereas, form, whereas the former is concerned with the views of others, the latter is a meditation on one's own situation. Campbell's account of doing philosophy historically is clearly an improvement on Hare's. His explanation of this enterprise's goal and method is instructive and, I think, largely right. But like Hare's account, it does not say enough about the kind of illumination that this enterprise offers. Campbell is surely right to claim that doing philosophy historically is valuable because it promotes self-understanding and insight into one's own present situation. No doubt there is important insight to be gained by identifying and clarifying the philosophical problems that become decisive for us. So what sort of, but what sort of insight is this? Is it merely historical insight and understanding of the historical circumstances that have caused these problems to be decisive? If so, then why is this insightful, insight philosophical and how does it help us come to terms with these problems philosophically? Moreover, why should this process be characterized as doing philosophy historically as opposed to merely tracing the history of ideas? 
Or could it perhaps be that identifying and clarifying the roots of our current situation offers philosophical insight in the sense that it shows that certain philosophical views are true or false, significant or insignificant? If so, then what is the particular value of acquiring these insights by doing philosophy, philosophy historically? If materialism is untenable, say, or the mind-body problem is pseudo-problem, then what is it to be gained by learning this by consulting history? Could we not learn this by reflecting on these positions themselves without tracing their histories? Campbell's account does not, it seems, explain why it is illuminating to do philosophy historically. It labels this illumination a type of self-understanding, but fails to describe what is valuable about such self-understanding. In short, Campbell does not really avoid the problem in a Harris account. He simply pushes it back a level. What seems missing from both of these accounts is an explanation of the kind of illumination a study of the history of philosophy offers. We need to understand how knowledge of this history might help one to do philosophy. Perhaps we could determine that this if we first ask what kind of illumination the study of history offers in general. How does studying the history of, of a thing help us understand the thing? What type of understanding, what type of illumination is involved here? If we could answer these questions, perhaps we would see how this type of understanding can contribute to doing philosophy. In order to do this, I now turn to an account of the goal and the value of historical inquiry. The account of the genetic method offered by John Herman Randall. Randall and the genetic method. In Nature and Historical Experience, John Herman Randall poses the following question. How does a knowledge of the history of anything function as an instrument for comprehending that thing? Just what about that thing does it enable us to explain? What can we learn about a thing by studying it through a genetic method? By understanding that something is so because it has come about so, as Gadamer puts it. Obviously, history does not explain everything. If we wish to know why a thing is as it is, it's not enough to discover its historical origins as though the mere record of the past somehow explains the present. After all, the historical record, far from explaining everything about the present, is itself a result that has to be explained. More generally, identifying a thing's historical origin does not always, or even often, allow us to understand it adequately. Historical knowledge may reveal, point to, give the locus of origins, Randall argues, but it does not explain them. In short, identifying a thing's origin is no substitute to understanding its nature. The genetic method of learning about a thing through its history is not a general method for understanding all kinds of things. It is, however, indispensable for understanding some things. There are some things, the nature of which it is to develop. As F.G.E. Woodbridge puts it, the nature of a thing may be progressive. This may enter into its substance. Though the study of a thing's genesis is not a general method for understanding all things, it is an indispensable method for the study of things, the nature of which is to develop. Consider a seed. What is involved in understanding what a seed is and why it is as it is? In one sense, of course, we understand a seed once we have analyzed its chemical makeup, once we have identified its physical structures, and determined the materials out of which those structures are composed. After all, there is nothing more to the seed than its physical makeup. Everything that will happen to the seed is a function of its initial chemical composition. The seed's chemical properties act as a set of passive powers boundaries beyond which the operation of the seed's process's growth cannot go. And we can, analyze, we can analyze this chemical constitution in isolation without knowing what will later happen to the seed as it turns into a plant. In one sense, then, we know what the seed is, why it is as it is, when we have exhaustively enumerated its chemical properties. It seems clear, however, that someone who understood the seed solely in this way would be missing something. She would have a complete snapshot of the seed's passive powers, but she would be missing out on the most interesting aspect of the seed. 
and understanding what these powers can do. She would be able to enumerate the seed's passive powers, but she would not know how they exhibit themselves in the seed's process of growth. We, can learn, we cannot learn this from an analysis of the passive powers themselves, because these powers manifest themselves only by an interaction with other factors. As Randall puts it, quote, the specific chemical structure is essential, but it's not the only factor essential. Other factors are needed to set those factors in operation to serve as stimuli or active powers. The soil, moisture, and sunlight interact with the seed as efficient causes or dynamic factors. They are selective of the powers of that constitution, determine which of them shall be realized within it the limits set, end quote. Now, this is not to say that the seed has some nature other than its physical properties, a separate entelechy. For example, that is responsible for its growth, but it is re irreducible to its chemical properties. It is to say, however, that these properties reveal themselves only over time through the growth of the seed as they interact with environmental factors. A complete chemical analysis of the seed, Randall argues, will not lead us to expect such a growth, but confronted by that growth, we would find such a seed to be a necessary factor or condition of its appearance. Someone who could describe a seed's chemical composition but did not know how its composition manifested itself in the seed's growth would fail to understand something crucial about the nature of the seed. The point is that the seed as we know it is an interaction of two different sets of properties. The first are the chemical properties that can be determined by analyzing the seeds in isolation. Randall calls this collection of properties the material of its career. It is a set of passive powers, but what those powers can do is discoverable only when they operate in the career. These operationals require a set of active powers, sunlight, soil, and other dynamic factors that cause the potential latent in its chemical properties to become actual. In one sense, of course, it is possible to give an exhaustive account of the seed's passive powers by viewing them St statically, but by describing the seed's chemical makeup without making reference to its role later plays in the seed's growth. But in another sense, we do not understand the seed's passive powers until we see what they can do. To understand the nature of the seed is not just to recognize that it has certain passive powers, but to see these powers in action by watching them manifest themselves in the seed's growth. If it is in the nature of the seed to develop, then understanding the seed's passive power means understanding the role they play in its development. Now consider a human society. It is obviously far more complex than a seed, and it's unlikely we could ever give an exhaustive list of its material properties. But a human society is like a seed in that it's an interaction of active and passive powers. A society's passive powers are its various patterns of organization comparable to the chemical constitutions of the seed, patterns of economic, political, and religious organizations, for example, these passive powers limit what the society can become. Just as the growth of a seed is constrained by its initial chemical composition, a human society can develop only within the limits set by its material properties. A society's active powers, by contrast, are specific human actions, or what men actually do, and such concrete human action is determined only by the social habits, also, but also by conscious and reflected attempts to deal with the problem forced upon them. As with the seed, we can gain a sort of understanding of society by looking only at the former, by taking a snapshot of its economic structures or religious institutions, for example. But to do so would be to miss something crucial, namely a recognition of what these powers can do. To understand a human society is not just to identify its passive powers, but to see what those powers can do by observing them in action. It is not just to identify a set of capacities, but to see how these capacities manifest themselves in the development of the society. The way we observe these powers in action is by tracking the society's development over time by examining its history. In short, just as the case of the seed, what these determinations or limits set to the powers of society by its various organizations, its constitution actually are, is revealed only in its history. When we study a society's history, we learn the same sort of thing that we learn by observing the growth of a seed. We learn that the society structures are capable of what its passive powers can do by watching them develop over time. Of course, there is a sense in which we can understand these structures in isolation, 
just as there's a sense which you can understand a seed solely by not analyzing its chemical makeup. But to do so would be to ignore what is most interesting about a society. We do not really understand a society until we observe its structures in action. We do not really know what it can do until we can see what sort of things it has done. Tracing a society's historical development is thus an indispensable way of arriving at a full understanding of it. Note 30. Note that, note that the historical study of society is a complement to the static study of its structure, not a substitute for it. To understand a society, it is to do more than record what happens to it. We must identify its passive powers, its economic and cultural organizations, for example, and then see how they manifest themselves in the society's history. In other words, understanding a society has both historical and non-historical moments. Paul Ricoeur made a similar point about the interpretation of text. Contra Dilte, Ricoeur argues that such interpretation always involves both. I don't know how to pronounce these words. And that each activity complements the other. Back to the text. What this suggests is that the genetic method yields a very specific kind of understanding. It is properly applied to a specific kind of object, namely something such as a seed or a human society or something whose nature it is to develop. It gives rise to a very specific kind of understanding and one that goes beyond an ability to enumerate a thing's properties. To understand a thing genetically is to know not just what its passive powers are, but what they can do. It is to see what the thing is and it's not capable of by tracking the paths that its development takes and does not take. The type of understanding offered by the genetic method is valuable because there are things whose capacity for development is the most interesting fact about them. For this kind of thing, tracing their temporal development yields an indispensable kind of understanding and a kind of understanding that, that probably cannot begin in any other way. The evolution of philosophical pictures. Let us return to philosophy. To do philosophy historically would be to import the genetic method into philosophy. What would this involve? The short answer, of course, is that it would involve carrying out a genetic study of some object in the philosophical domain. It would be to maintain that this object, like that sea or a human society, is the sort of thing, the nature of which it is to develop. It would be to claim that the object in question is an interaction of active and passive powers, and as a result, we cannot understand it without tracing its development. To understand this object, we might say, is to see its powers in action, such as they can and cannot be, uh, do by tracing what they do over time. Such an inquiry would have the same goal as the study of the history of a society. It would seek a kind of illumination that consists not just in knowledge of a thing's properties, but in a familiarity with what those properties can do. In short, to do philosophy historically would be to study some object in the philosophical domain. As we study the growth of a seed or the evolution of a society, to, to understand that this object is to is so because dot 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 has come about so. But which object? What would be the focus of such a study? What is the philosophical equivalent of the growing seed or the evolving society? One thing seems clear, the object of such an inquiry cannot be the theories that philosophers advance or the arguments that they give to support these theories. As we have seen, the genetic method is properly applied only to something the nature of which it is to develop. Theories and arguments do not seem to be the sort of things that develop. A theory is either true or false. We may speak of theories evolving over time, but generally what this means is that older theories are supplanted by new, slightly different ones. Theories rise and fall, and their successors are often very similar to them, but a particular theory does not grow. The same is true of arguments. An argument is either sound or unsound. Occasionally, we may speak of the argument evolving as when we discuss the evolution of the ontological argument, for example. But insofar as the different versions of the ontological argument contain different premises and sometimes different conclusions, they are best understood as distinct arguments, sharing family resemblances, not stages in the evolution of a single argument. 
When philosophers describe what they do, they usually assign a central place to theories and arguments. Consider the following description of, of philosophy, which Louis Poitman gives in an introductory textbook. Well, the hallmark of philosophy is centered in the argument. Philosophers clarify concepts, analyze the te and test propositions and beliefs, but the major task is to analyze and construct arguments. Philosophical reasoning is closely allied to scientific reasoning in both look for evidence and build hypotheses that are tested with the hope of coming closer to the truth, end quote. Most philosophers, I suspect, would accept Poshman's characterization of what they do. If we accept this characterization, however, then it is difficult to see how there can be any room in philosophy for the genetic method. This method studies things that evolve. Philosophers generally take themselves to be concerned with theories and arguments, things that do not evolve. So how can it be possible for philosophers to use the genetic method? How can philosophy be done historically? The proper response, I think, is that there is another way of understanding what philosophers do. It is possible to see philosophers doing something other than just articulating theories and supporting them with arguments. As Gary Gottman has argued, it is very important to distinguish between the theory that provides a specific detailed formulation of philosophical positions, such as Platonic realism or Berkeleyan idealism, and the general picture of reality that such formulations are trying to articulate. An example of philosophical theory would be the specific version of dualism that Descartes develops in the meditation, or the specific account of moral obligation that Kant gives in his second critique. These theories are specifically these theories are specific, detailed answers to specific philosophical questions, and they are supported by equally specific and detailed arguments. Few contemporary philosophers accept these theories just as Descartes and Kant formulate them, and fewer still accept the precise arguments that Descartes and Gave give to support them. Nevertheless, it is relatively common to describe contemporary philosophers in their theories as Cartesian or Kantian. Why? The answer, it seems, is that in addition to developing detailed theories and arguments, philosophers are simultaneously in the business of articulating pictures of reality. The Cartesian and the Kantian pictures of reality are broader and more flexible than the specific theories advanced by Descartes and Kant. They also occupy a different place in our intellectual landscape. Since theories are either true or false, they are the sorts of things that we either accept or reject. Does it make sense to speak of theories being proved or refuted? Philosophical pictures are different. As Gooding puts it, philosophers are often able to refute a particular theoretical formulation, the dualism of Descartes' meditation, the phenomenalism of Ayer's language, truth, and logic, but they seldom, if ever, refute the general pictures that the theoretical formulations articulate. In a sense, of course, all philosophers develop theories and support them with arguments. Philosophers never advance the Cartesian picture of reality in the abstract. They advance only specific theoretical formulations of this picture. But to say that philosophers develop theories is not, only, is not the only way of characterizing what they do, and it's far from clear that it is the most illuminating one. It's equally possible to see them as in the business of articulating and refining pictures of reality. This point is important to the this point is important because while philosophical theories are not the sort of things that develop, philosophical pictures are. Pictures change over time by being refined, criticized by finding different and often increasingly subtle theoretical expressions. This change is not a mere replacement of one picture by another, but a working out of the picture's possibilities. Tracing the history of a philosophical picture lets us see what this picture can do what its strengths and weaknesses are, what possibilities and limitations it has. Consider the evolution of what may be called the Cartesian picture of the world. The Cartesian picture has found many different theoretical articulations, from Descartes' own philosophical works to the work of other early modern philosopher, philosophers up to the present. Descartes' own formulation of this picture showed certain promise. It went some way towards explaining how freedom of the will could be reconciled with the mechanistic view of nature, and it illustrated how mathematical methods of reasoning could be fruitfully extended to other areas. But it also had obvious limitations, such as its difficulty explaining the relationship of the mind to the body and of finite substances to God. 
These difficulties were explored by later thinkers working within a broadly Cartesian picture of the world. Millebranche, for example, Millebranche accepted the most central aspect of Descartes' philosophy. For example, the claim that philosophy must proceed by means of clear and distinct ideas, while rejecting other less central ones, such as the claim that we have a clear and distinct idea of the self. The work of Melibranch and later thinkers probed and refined the work of Melibranch and later thinkers probed and refined the Cartesian picture, revealing in more detail what a Cartesian picture of reality can do and what its advantages and limitations are. The process of criticism and refinement has continued to the present. Even in the middle of the 20th century, it was not shocking to see a philosopher as remote from classical modern philosophy as Edmund Husserl describes himself as a Cartesian. Note 37. Consider the introductions to the Cartesian med meditations where Husserl calls transcendental phenomenology a neo-Cartesian, even though it is obliged and precisely by its radical development of Cartesian motifs to reject nearly all well-known doctrinal contents of the Cartesian philosophy. Edmund Husserl, Cartesian Meditations, uh, 1991, further proof that Husserl distinguishes the Cartesian picture of reality from Descartes' specific versions of it comes later in, an, in the introductions of this text, where Husserl says that his work reawakens the impulse of the Cartesian Meditations not to adopt their content, but in not doing so, to renew it with greater intensity the radicalness of their spirit. Back to the text. Like the growth of a sea, the evolution of the Cartesian picture can be seen as an interaction of passive and active powers. Its passive powers would be the material of Cartesianism, its core thesis, its internal logic, and what, we, what may be called the overall spirit. Its active powers will be the factors that provoke the material's evolution, particular works by particular Cartesian philosophers, their distinctive goals and agendas, the cultural and intellectual milieus in which they worked, and so on. The interaction of these powers is what causes the Cartesian picture of reality to evolve. One might try to learn about the Cartesian picture by studying Descartes' work alone, but someone familiar only with Descartes' writing and now with the work of Melibranch, Husserl, and other philosophers who articulated a similar version, vision of the world, would have a one-sided understanding of the Cartesian picture. Like someone who studies only the chemical compositions of a seed, she would have a snapshot of its properties at one stage in development, but not a full appreciation of what these properties are capable of. This is the sort of appreciation we gain by tracing a picture's historical evolution. By seeing how pictures evolve, we learn how they can, what they can do, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what problems they do a good job of addressing, and what stumbling blocks they seem unable to overcome. Just as we do not really understand a seed until we see it in action, we do not really understand a philosophical picture until we have looked at it in the light of its history. What I would like to propose is that doing philosophy historically involves tracing the development of philosophical pictures. It involves a it involves studying how one or more of the major pictures of reality, the Cartesian or the Platonic pictures, for example, evolve over time. The aim of this activity, however, is not merely to catalog a series of changes in what people have thought. Rather, it is to see that these changes reveal about what a given picture can do. It is to gain insight into what a picture's strengths and weaknesses are, what it is and is not capable of by studying the picture in action. This insight is philosophical. When we see what a philosophical picture can do, we learn what and to what extent it is a live option for us. We learn how powerful and flexible it is, how it compares with competing pictures, and how well it coheres with other things we care about. Moreover, doing philosophy historically yields a kind of philosophical insight that cannot be gained through either pure philosophy or pure history of philosophy. After all, both of these enterprises study philosophical theories, present or past. They may well tell us a great deal about specific theoretical expressions of this or that picture, but it is not their job to assess and probe these pictures themselves. This is a task prop. This is a task properly left to the enterprise known as doing philosophy historically. When we do philosophy historically, we seek philosophical insight but philosophical insight of a distinctive kind. 
and the kind that may be difficult or impossible to gain in other ways. What reason is there to accept this account of doing philosophy historically? One reason, of course, is that it is consistent with a broader reflection on the value of history in general, a reflection such as Randall's. A better reason is that it seems to describe accurately what many historically-minded philosophers actually do. Those who do philosophy historically, those who seek philosophical illumination by studying the past, rarely have as their object particular theories or arguments. They rarely turn to the past in the hope of solving specific philosophical problems or answering specific philosophical questions. Instead, they tend to be concerned with what I have called philosophical pictures, broad conceptions of the way the world is. Moreover, they typically study these pictures to learn the sorts of things that the genetic method can teach us. An appreciation of what certain pictures can do and what and of what their distinctive possibilities and limitations are. Heidegger's historical works, for example, invariably turn to the past in order to show how certain picture of reality, Platonism, for example, or onto theology, has both guided Western philosophical theories and blinded them to certain things. The same is true of Derrida's study of past thinkers. These studies have these studies always proceed through close readings of specific texts, but they generally do so to see how these texts embody some more broader picture of reality. Logocentrism, for example, or the metaphysics of presence. Even a work such as Rorty's Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature, which poses the same very specific theoretical questions in epistemology and philosophy of mind, is largely an exploration of philosophical picture the representational picture that sees the mind as a mirror that reflects reality. The account of doing philosophy historically that I have given is not only consistent with a broader reflection on the value of history, it also sits well with what historically-minded philosophers actually do. One moment. More on pictures. My discussion so far has relied heavily on the notion of philosophical picture. To some, this notion will seem unfamiliar and in need of clarification. To others, it will seem problematic of a, and of questionable value. It may be hopelessly confused or redundant or of no practical use. So at this point, it might be helpful to look more closely at the notion of philosophical picture in order to clarify its meaning and justify its use. Perhaps the best way to proceed is by examining a number of difficulties that the notion seems to rise. Race. One problem is that a philosophical picture may seem too general to be useful, perhaps too general to be intellectually responsible. One might argue that there, are, there really are no philosophical pictures, only particular philosophers who answer particular questions by advancing particular theories. Philosophers, one might argue, may resemble each other in all sorts of ways, but no two great philosophers share anything as specific or as substantial as philosophical pictures are alleged to be. Any picture might attribute to them will inevitably turn out to be hopelessly artificial and rarefied. One might worry that to say that Descartes, Malebranche, and Husserl shared the same broad conception of reality. The Cartesian picture of reality is to impose a vacuous label on those thinkers. It is, it is to view these thinkers in an excessive general way and ignore their subtleties. In short, one might argue that the notion of a philosophical picture is based on a superficial approach to the history of ideas. Rather than imposing common conceptions of, of reality on great thinkers of the past, we ought to pay close attention to what is individual and particular in their work. This worry is legitimate up to a point. It is certainly possible to read past philosophers in a superficial way. It is possible to impose labels on them that are too general and that ignore subtleties of their thought. But it does not follow that all labels do so or that philosophical pictures must be reifications that fail to do justice to the particularities of great philosophers' work. A great deal hinges on what a picture are understood to be. If a picture is taken to be a static thing, for example, a set of these accepted by several philosophers, 
then most pictures will be too general to be helpful. It seems unlikely that there is a list of Cartesian theses accepted by Descartes, Mellebranck, and Husserl, or at least it seems unlikely that any such a list of the theses would be long enough or controversial enough to be very interesting. But philosophical pictures need not be identified with a collection of theses. It is more helpful to understand pictures dynamically, not as a static set of principles, but as dispositions to approach philosophical problems in certain characteristic ways. To be a Cartesian on this view is to tend to draw on certain strategies and resources while addressing philosophical problems. We might say, for example, that Cartesians are philosophers who attach a great deal of importance to the sort of evidence that manifests themselves within thinking subjectivity and who are typically reluctant to draw on any other kinds. A general disposition of this sort is, I think, shared by Descartes, Lebranche, and Husserl, even though not a single set of theses is. Seen in this light, philosophical pictures are much more like what Arthur Danto calls methodological directives. They're not explanations of phenomena, but injunctions to seek explanations of a certain kind. They're not static, but dynamic. A second problem with the notion of philosophical pictures is that it seems difficult to apply. It can be hard to decide which picture we should use to describe a given figure. Any number of different pictures might seem equally applicable to one and the same philosopher. Consider again the example of the cards. Which picture, which broad conception of reality does the card work, does the card's work exemplify? Obviously, we could describe the card as an example of the Cartesian picture of reality, that is, of the picture that attaches particular importance to the sort of evidence available to thinking subjectivity. But we could also see the card as an example of the picture called modernity, roughly the picture that stresses the supreme importance of reason in human affairs, contra the claims of tradition, the ancestors, and especially the church, as Robert Pippin has put it. Or we could see Descartes embodying yet another picture, for example, Rory's representational picture, according to which the mind is a mirror whose job is to represent real reality accurately. Descartes is associated with all these pictures and with a great many others as well. Is one of these pictures the right, the right one to apply? Do all apply equally? Are some better than others? Matters are complicated further by the complex relations that hold among pictures. The picture called modernity, for example, presumably contains the Cartesian picture, since Cartesian philosophers are modern philosophers as well. The modern picture in turn overlaps significantly with Rory's representational picture, without being entirely contained by it. Many modern philosophers, though not all, are representationalists, and many representationalists, though not all, are also moderns. In short, the complex relation among pictures seems to make them difficult to apply and perhaps of little value in making sense of past thought. What should we say about this objection? It is clear that the relation among philosophical pictures are often complicated and messy. But it is not clear that this messiness is a problem. A great many other notions stand in equally complex relations, but are perfectly intelligible and are often invaluable in making sense of the world. Consider the example of goals. Goals are related to one another in a range of complex and messy ways. Some goals contain other goals, such as when the goal of finishing one's education contains the goal of writing a final exam. Some goals overlap with other goals, as when I read a novel, both because it is required by my studies and because I enjoy it. It can be difficult to identify which goal a given action is intended to achieve. There may be several obvious possibilities, or none. Yet it would be absurd to suggest that these complexities make the notion of a goal unintelligible, or that they reduce its value in making sense of the world. A similar notion, example is the notion of a movement of, or tradition in literature and the arts. It is clear that one and the same figure can belong to several movements, movements at once. Kafka is both an expressionist and a modernist. Stravinsky is both a neoclassicist and a tonalist. It is obviously not a problem that artistic movements are related in these complex and messy ways. On the contrary, the labels associated with these movements are valuable because precisely they help us see the complexity. That is because they draw our attention to the multifaceted character of an artist's work. Philosophical pictures, I suspect, are similar. Viewing philosophers as a representative of, a, of several pictures at once is not only legitimate, 
it is instructive because it can help us to notice complexities in his or her work that might otherwise escape our attention. Seen in this light, the diversity of philosophical pictures is not a problem, but a benefit. Note 43. As I will argue in chapter 2, the fact that philosophical pictures can overlap and be related in other complex ways is closely connected to the nature of narrative, particularly the way in which the elements of one narrative can be constructed, construed differently in another. David Carr puts it this way. Nothing is more common than the retrospective revision whereby the elements of one story become the elements of another. The movements and strokes of my tennis game were supposed to be part of my victory in the tennis match. Instead, they are part of the sad story of my developing back problems, which forced me out of the match. Similarly, the same elements can be viewed by different persons at the same time as part of very different stories. See David Carr, The Time, Narrative, and History. We might also add that the same elements of a philosopher's work can be viewed by different persons at the same time as embodying very different philosophical pictures. Back to the text. How do we decide which picture to apply to a given thinker? How do we individuate pictures and determine how they relate to each other? The answer, surely, is that we do so in ad hoc ways according to pragmatic concerns. Consider once more the example of artistic and literary traditions. How do we decide whether to call Kafka a modernist or an expressionist? It depends on what we're trying to do with these labels, that is, on which aspect of his work we wish to highlight. Similarly, which picture we associate with a given philosopher depends on what we're trying to point out about the philosopher's work. This, in turn, is a function of our priorities, our goals, and our philosophical agendas. What reason will we have for describing the car by means of one picture rather than another? Why, for example, does Rorty see himself as embodying the representational picture, see him as embodying the representational picture, rather than the Cartesian or modern pictures? Rory speaks this way because he wants us to see things about the history of ideas that he believes have not been adequately noticed. He wants us to recognize something we may not have seen before, that the picture which holds traditional philosophy captive is out of the mind as a great mirror containing various representations. He wants us to see similar similarities among philosophers that may have escaped our attention. For example, similarities between ancient and modern approaches to knowledge, similarly stemming from a common reliance on the image of the mind as a mirror. Rory sees the similarities as important because of this, of his background in the philosophy of mind, and he speaks of one picture rather than another because he wants us to see their importance too. A different philosopher with a different orientation might be struck by other features of the history of thought. She might find the difference between ancient and modern approaches to knowledge more striking than the similarities. She would associate the cards with different picture because her goals and agenda are different. In short, the tools we use to understand the history of thought depend on a large extent on what we're trying to do with it. Does this mean that the study of philosophical pictures is relativistic? No more so than any other enterprise. Any intellectual endeavor must divide up its terrain somehow. It must organize its subject matter by means of some theoretical framework, a body of concepts that make the subject matter intelligible. There is never just one way of doing so. Alternative frameworks are always possible. A historian, for example, might organize her subject matter in terms of classes or nation states or any number of other concepts. Clearly, the claims we make in this discipline in a discipline depend on which theoretical framework we use to organize its subject matter. A historian who takes the concept of class as fundamental will end up saying very different things about a history than one who privileges the concept of the nation state. The study of philosophical picture is no different in this respect. Two different philosophers may view the history of thought in terms of two very different sets of pictures, perhaps conflicting or incompatible ones. What they say about the past philosophy will be a function of will be relative to their choice of theoretical framework. But the claims of a historian or an economist or a physicist are relative in the exact same way. Of course, the term relativism is usually taken to mean something stronger, namely that no way of, think of talking about the subject is better or truer than any other. There is no reason to think that the study of philosophical pictures is relativistic in this sense. Granted, there may be disputes in this enterprise that are difficult or impossible to settle, 
There may be no fact of the matter about whether the car is really a modern philosopher or representationalist, but no matter which sort of pictures one uses to make sense of the past, though there will be pictures that clearly do not apply to the car, he will clearly never be labeled materialist, for example. Moreover, of the pictures that can be applied to the card, some might well turn out to be better than others. It may well, may well be that at the end of the day, it is more instructive or even more true to call the card a modern philosopher than to call him a representationalist or vice versa. The crucial point, however, is that we should expect to discover this only after the fact. The way to determine whether some pictures are better than others is to try to them out, is to try them, to apply them to the history of thought and see how well they work. In all likelihood, some will prove completely unsuccessful, and some will prove more successful than others. But there is no way to know in advance which ones will succeed. It would be foolish to rule out the possibility of right and wrong answers in the study of philosophical pictures, but if we find such answers, we should expect to find them a posteriori. The only way to find them is to look. One question remains. What is the difference between pictures and theories? It is often easy enough to recognize the examples of each when we see them. We have little difficulty, for example, distinguishing the work of Descartes or Melbranche from the Cartesian picture that is their work and bodies. But what is the basis of such distinctions? Sometimes I have repeatedly, something I have repeatedly mentioned in that pictures are more general than theories. Theories are specific and detailed formulations of pictures. Pictures are more flexible and more abstract than the pictures that instantiate them. But generality is not the only difference. After all, some theories are more general than others, and it may be possible for a theory to be so general that it starts to resemble a picture. So what else distinguishes them? Another difference, as we have seen, is that pictures and theories are different sorts of things. A theory is a set of propositions or a collection of answers to a certain philosophical question. A picture, by contrast, is a disposition, a tendency to approach philosophical questions in a characteristic way. It is not the answer to any specific question, but an injunction to seek answers of a certain kind. Finally, an important difference between theories and pictures is that they perform different functions. We form theories in order to state what is the case. But as I will argue in chapter two, we advance claims about the pictures in order to achieve a different goal. That goal is to bring about a change in our audience, and more specifically, a change in our audience's way of seeing the philosophers of the past. But that is a matter for the next chapter.